Just follow along. Stand up. It's simple. Simple. Okay, now look around. All those people sitting down, their moms. Give them a standing ovation. They deserve it. For those of you who are confused, you can sit down now. Thank you so much. Thank you, moms. Happy Mother's Day to my wife again and uh, my daughter out in Topeka with the best grandchildren in the whole wide world. And uh, thank you, Lord. I know we could say Happy Grandma's Day to all the grandmas, too. But uh, Dr. James Dobson from... Uh, the Dobson Family Institute, he puts out all kinds of things, of course, in family. That's his ministry. And uh, A couple of months ago, I saw something, and then I went looking for it and found it again. Um, I saw it. I get uh, sometimes just little links to things, but uh, I just want to read a little something, some encouragement for moms before we get into our message. We're going to use Galatians chapter number 4. We're going to cover verses 12 through 20, which are pretty neat since they talk about... Uh, Paul being a spiritual parent, and uh, we can relate quite a bit from the word because he looks at this bunch of people, the Galatians, as his spiritual children. Um, they are uh, to him very, very precious, and of course he knows they belong to the Father in heaven. He covered that historical argument for grace when we looked at the first 11 verses last time. And now we're going to look at a few verses and see that he has a real sentimental approach to the people. And that's, that lines up with being a parent. And, and so let me just read a little encouragement to all of you moms this morning. This is about midway through his letter of words of encouragement for moms. It, was, it went up in March of this year. At times, do you find yourself thinking, I love this kid more than anything in, this, in the world, but I don't really like him or her very much. That's how he gets going in this paragraph. We can't get along for more than 10 minutes without clashing over relatively insignificant matters. Why does this child make me so angry when what I want most is harmony and love? Why is our relationship so unsatisfying and disturbing? What did I do to mess up something that began with such promise and hope? Not only have I failed my child, but I have also failed God too. Now think of what I'm reading here as it ties to our message and Paul speaking to the Galatians about how we started with this incredible gospel and how it saved your soul. And now how did we get here? It's kind of the way Paul's talking to the people in our text this morning. He continues in his little letter to the moms for encouragement. Let's talk about those feelings for a moment, which are common at one time or another within almost all caring parents. Parenthood can be a very guilt-inducing proposition. Babies come into our life when we are young and immature, and there are no instruction manuals to guide our first halting steps. There is no manufacturing tag on a newborn's wrist that says, some assembly required. So we take those tiny human beings home with us, not yet knowing who they are, and then proceed to bumble along as best we can. As a consequence, many of the day-by-day -day decisions we make on their behalf are the result of sheer guesswork, as we hope against hope that we are doing the right thing. He continues, Our own inadequacies also get in the way. We become tired and frustrated and selfish, which sometimes affects our judgment in those moments where we react without thinking and realize the next morning that we have handled things all wrong. This is the last part I'm going to read. It has a little more after this, but I believe this is a good spot to end. He says this in about the eighth paragraph. In short, children are maddeningly complex, that it is impossible to raise them without making many blunders and mistakes. After about 20 years of on-the-job training, we begin to figure out what parenting is all about. And then by this time, it's time to let go. And we don't, and pretend that we don't care anymore. 
which is all of you know who are empty nesters. That is not true. You just have to pretend, oh, a little bit of encouragement for moms this morning to have you realize you're not alone, that it is the greatest vocation calling on the earth to raise your children as a mom. And I thank the Lord for my wife and for my daughter raising their children the way they have, and of course, my mom. And uh, I thank the Lord, and Mother's Day is a, a special time in the United States culture and American culture. And so, have a wonderful day with your family celebrating Mother's Day. And I don't know which particular person prayed for the pouring rain last night to wash out men's softball, but you got your way. Praise the Lord. Drew, that's never happened to us before, has it? <laughs> That's pretty fun, though. It rained like almost two inches last night. But we played Happy Five Soccer yesterday. Yeah. There was 200 and something kids very happy. Praise the Lord. This morning's word is in verses 12 through 20. And we're going to read it here in a moment. But I just want to have you look at this question up on the screen. At this point, Paul must remind the Galatians, just like we were reminded about being moms and parents, that you have a relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ that's paramount. I need to remind you, you need to remember because that's at the centerpiece and the beginning piece of all your success. But he did say in our text last week in verse number 11, I, I am afraid of you. It's up on the screen in Galatians 4.11, our message finished here with, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What is he saying? Very simply this, and some other versions will change the word from of to for. That's not the same thing here. I'm afraid for you. <laughs> I'm afraid of you. Because the context is saying, look, in all that I've said about you being adopted into the family of God, Father Abraham, and of course, Abba Father, as he mentions in the first 11 verses of chapter number 4, he's saying, look, historically you're ingrained into it and you're engrafted by Jesus. So look, when you started this way in Jesus, gospel preached, I, I gave it all I had and the Lord gave it all he had. And you started out beautifully. But I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of where you're going. I'm afraid of what's going to happen to you is what he's saying. Because your testimony of really believing in grace, of how it's for by grace are you saved. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid. And I think about Paul's heart here. And as I put up that statement in the beginning, he had to constantly remind so many of the churches that, hey, you started out in Jesus. You're to continue in Jesus by grace. How is it that you got to this place? Because the battle of souls and the battle for souls is real. It continues constantly after salvation. It's one thing for the devil to say, hey, I've got that person. They die and they go to hell without Jesus Christ as Savior. And if that's you this morning here, I pray that you will consider where your lost soul will spend eternity because it will spend eternity in a godless hell that will then go to the second death, the lake of fire, and that will be for all of eternity. The battle for souls continues after salvation for those of you that are saved this morning. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That you said, okay, I need to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll be saved. Then what happens to you? Because the devil wants to mess with you then too. And he's at work to mess with believers. What happens to a believer when they're left to themselves? Just to fend to themselves, just to try and get through and get by. Well, it says here, and this will be the last verse in our text today, on verse number 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt, not for you, but of you. I'm afraid of you, and I stand in doubt of you. Maybe the Father's saying that to you today. Maybe that's where 
Paul communing that, communicating this again to the churches of Galatia, these Galatian believers. He's saying, look, I'm not present with you. I'm writing a letter by the Holy Spirit. I would love to get there. This is in 53, 54 uh, AD, around that time. Uh, and this church has been established. The churches of Galatia have been established in the southern end of his first missionary trip. He's gone there. He's gone there with, Bar uh, uh, with Barnabas as they've been separated out. They've done preaching. The churches have been planted. It's not the only place. And now he's writing the letter and he's saying, you know, maybe since I'm not with you, I've kind of lost a feel for things in my rebuking and my exhorting of you. Maybe I would have to change it because I stand in doubt of you. I really don't know your condition. Maybe I need to get there. Maybe, maybe it, it means that I would have to soften my voice. Maybe as Paul is saying this to the Galatians, he's saying, hey, you know what? It is grace, and I need to exhort you, and I need to extol the Lord, and I, and I need to challenge you, and, and I need to rebuke you. But would it be that maybe if I could be there face to face, because I would love to be with you, and that I would know of your state personally and particularly, and not just by hearing something, that I would know how to pray, that I would know how to alter my voice, that I would know how to speak to you in a different way, and maybe I would soften up my rebuke. Maybe that's what Paul is saying there, because he really loves these people. His sentimental heart says, I'm affectionately yours. You see, that's our message today. Paul is saying to you and to me, as believers in the Lord, the body of Christ, I write to you, I'm affectionately yours. What does it mean to be affectionate, to say, I'm affectionately yours? Maybe you've read, written a letter to someone you care so very much about, and you said, affectionately yours. Affection is defined as a fond attachment. It's devotion, it's love, it's a recognition that my deepest, deepest heart belongs to someone. He's saying, I belong to you. I'm totally and completely invested in you. It's like saying, hey, I love you, I love you, I love you. In fact, I love you with all my heart. It's like saying, bless the Lord, oh my soul and all is within me. I bless the Lord for you. I bless the Lord for you and who you are as a people. And that's what Paul is saying today. So as we read Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 12 down through 20, I want you to think about him saying, I'm affectionately yours. I belong to you. I belong to the Lord. I care so much about you. I'll tell you what, in Jesus' name, I'd love to see something more for you. Here he goes, verse 12, brethren. And that's not the brethren like he's talking to some Jews, like he does reference at times. It's brethren because you are my brothers in the Lord. He's still affectionately speaking to them that way. He says, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye. Ye have not injured me at all. I'm personally involved in your life. I love you so very, very much. You and what you're going through does not hurt me. I'm still in with you. I still love you so much that no matter what has happened here, I just want to rebuke you. I want to do it in a way that shows love, but I want you to know that, brethren, you have not injured me at all. What a great opening statement. Okay, so he continues here, verse number 13. Ye know how through an infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Think about this. He was looked at by them when he came to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as an angel because he was coming in the name of Jesus. And they looked at him as a spiritual guy that is preaching the, the message and going, who is this guy? He's got to be an angel from God. That's the way they saw him when you look at him preaching to those people of Galatia. He's saying, look, you know what? <laughs> you loved me so much when I showed up that you <laughs> basically called me like an angel. Powerful statement. And why is he bringing this up? I say this before the next couple verses. I want you to consider where this man's at here. And he's recounting how much they loved him to take care of him and that he was called the angel of God. He came in Jesus' name. And they went so far as to say, your infirmity, your flesh, in this case, and it's hard to nail it down because there's not a lot of info when you study out the scriptures to see what it is, but he's talking about how, hey, 
my infirmity, the throne of my flesh. I know there's been some different thoughts on that. Ultimately, physically, it would be his eyeballs. As much as you can see, it's his blindness, as much as what he went through there. But it's often said that it's not, it was beyond his flesh that it was his pride that he had to fight through. But in this context, look at what he says to the churches of Galatia in verses number 15 and 16. Remember when I came to you and my flesh was hurting? He says in verse 15, where is then the blessedness that ye spake of? Remember? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? We, we were so tight, so close. I loved you enough to be to come, you call me an angel. You angel of the Lord. You came in Jesus' name, and you, you you saw me as preaching the gospel. You got converted. You came to know Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit of God comes in. You now are born again. You saw me suffering physically with what I was going through, and you were willing to take your eyes, pluck them out to relieve my suffering. Do you realize how close? A bond he had with them? Kind of like the bond that a mom has with their child. When they're heartbroken over things that happen. Do you not know I gave my life and I would do anything for you? That's how Paul parented and mothered and fathered these people. And how they responded back with this incredible care and love for this man who preached and taught and spoke the words of life. He says in verse number 17 and 18, and talking about zealousness, he says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Who's they? The Judaizers. The ones that become Christians, they're born again. But now a Judaizer goes back and says, let me get the law of Judah back in there. Let me get the Levitical law back in to reinstate this fundamental legalistic way of living on top of and somehow ingrained into the grace of God. That's what Judaizers do. That's what religious people do. That's what legalists do. Legalists do. And he's saying, hey, the, they zealously affect you, but not well, not in a good way. He says, yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. He says in verse number 18, and continue with this zealously thinking, zealous thinking, he says, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So he's saying zealousness, being zealous for the right things and the good things is a good thing. But boy, oh boy, if you get zealous for the wrong thing, zealous for law, legalism, push God out of the way, listen to the Judaizers, fall into that trap, then you're in verse number 19 and 20 hearing him speak to you as little children. My little children, verse 19, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. <laughs> I travailed in birth when you were born again, and now I'm travailing like I'm in birth of you being totally and completely walking in Jesus Christ till he comes, for by grace are you saved through faith. That you're free to live faith by grace. And I labor, I am travailing in birth again, again over you. That's how much I care. And then it says in verse 20, which we read earlier, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. Instead of being so tough and so hard, my rebukes, they may need to be sweetened. Maybe I need to change my voice to say, hey, church, I stand in doubt of you, of whether you really, really look up on the wall and that theme for the Acts 1A conference and believe that uncommon is the way that we need to live. For by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. That our faith is actually uncommon to the point where we're not proclaiming our own goodness as some do. 
You see, Paul saw this beautiful church, these churches, these Galatian people, and said, I love you, and I know that you're going to go through some battles, and I care so much about you, so much so that Paul's sentimental argument for grace comes in here. So let me just spend a couple of minutes on this sentimental argument for grace, kind of give you a little give you a little uh, historical context. Let me give you a, a little doctrinal context because he's saying this, as I mentioned earlier when we were looking back there in verse number 12 and 13, he's saying, hey, just because you've backslidden, fallen into a hole of believing that keeping some rules and laws is the way to go, I, I still, I won't take it personal. I still love you and I care about you. You haven't hurt me. I've taken this departure from the truth, and I, and I see it as a place where I need to speak. Maybe that's the way you need to see things, is I need to speak about the departure from the truth to make sure that the truth of God's grace. You see, someone who's sentimental, I said earlier, is prompted by feelings of tenderness, sadness, or nostalgia. Nostalgia. You know, when you get a little older, you become a little bit more nostalgic. You go, eh. You know, and then you get a little soft, and you get a little weepy, and you, you have feelings of tenderness. Now, I know some of you are really young and strong and tough or even older, and, you know, you didn't even cry when old Yeller got put down. Come on. What about old Yeller? How many of you don't know who old Yeller is? He's a dog. Poor old yeller. Very sad. I wouldn't cry at that. When you have to take your pet, who's really, really old, to the veterinarian, I'm not going to mention nutmeg. Christine's going to, her eyeballs are like, Dad. We'll all be sentimental because the puppy dog, you know. Sentimental argument for grace means I am nostalgic. I have feelings of tenderness. I have a, a sense of sadness over what's going on. And I know you need to be reminded. I need to remind you of some things. Paul's attitude he shows there is so incredibly clear, but then you see their attitude toward him. And I want to remind you, biblically, I said it a little bit earlier, but Paul had an incredible relationship from the very beginning. His infirmity, the temptation, the drawing away, as he said, verse 14, my temptation which was in my flesh. It's, hey, this trial, this temptation of my faith, what am I going to do? Am I going to be drawn away or not? Paul is saying, hey, look, what happened to your acceptance of me? What happened? What, what, what happened with our willingness to just say, for by grace I receive you. For by grace I accept you both ways. There's a maturity there. There's a growth there. And it's in the ability for both, play, both parties to say, I completely understand, even if I don't, and I'm in. It's like both these parties saying, I don't know. Do you, do you see something in me? Yes, I see something in you and the way that you're going about your life in Christ. I, I, I haven't seen you act this way. You seem like you're trying to follow some regimen or some rules and some man's rules. Well, I don't know. I thank you for pointing that out, but I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, I'm still living the way that you showed me. You, you led me to the Lord and you, and you discipled me a little bit and you, and you walked me through the, the way to live in Christ and to have the Holy Spirit of God work in me, the Word of God to come alive. I see in you walking in a way that's totally to please yourself and man and it's become a self-righteousness. What happened? You see, that's Paul. Going back and forth in verses 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and he says again, as I mentioned earlier, how could you think that I am your enemy? Do you take the truthfulness of your friend 
and you use it against him? And somebody speaks truth to you and says, let me be honest with you. Let me be transparent with you. Let me bring things to the forefront. You see, Paul's attitude in verse 17, he just say, hey, look. I question the Judaizers. I'm looking at their motives. I'm watching what they're trying to do. But for you, I'm wondering how you're following it. The false teaching. What happened to what I taught you? I suggest this really simple thing is what Paul's saying. Hey, step back. Look at the purity and the cleanliness and the beauty and the perfectness of the gospel. See the word of God and how it's supposed to be. And let's follow and don't allow those Judaizers and those religious legalistic people to steal your joy, to steal your love, to steal the peace, to steal the fruit of the Spirit. Don't let them do that. You see, Paul is making a huge point here. And it's clear because, church, we need the same point. We have a wonderful beginning, all awesome times. Many a time, and, and it's really awesome, and we think, oh gosh, man, I got started, I walked with the Lord five, ten years, and then all of a sudden, fall a little bit away from the Lord, listen to somebody's story, listen to somebody's way, listen to somebody's legalism, listen to somebody's... It's amazing who shows up on a believer's doorstep when they're struggling. More religiousness. Your conversion for salvation was founded for by grace in Jesus, and then legalism shows up. A man-made way to somehow find holiness and sanctification. You see, the ministry of the gospel can drive you crazy sometimes. It can be tough. It can be frustrated because you expect things to be a certain way. <laughs> One can be clearly as genuine as genuine can be and yet be held with doubt and suspicion. What's your motivation, pastor? What are you going about? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to take the cover off of things and let everybody do whatever they want? That's not what grace says. That's not what grace teaches. See, God's people need to understand that when you get deeper into the word of God and you constantly stay in the word of God and you continually walk through that, then all of a sudden you start seeing those trouble things that alert you and go, wait a minute, that's not for by grace. That's not the way we're supposed to live. That's not how I'm supposed to get closer to the Lord, be more like Jesus Christ, be conformed to the image of Christ, have him just take over my life and now my decisions are, I love obeying you, Lord. I love doing what you want me to do, Lord. I love walking by faith, Lord. I love being holy as you are making me holy. I love setting myself apart unto you. It's my free will choice by your grace to live there. And yet, pastors and church leaders are faced with things that become difficult when it comes to the legalism way. You see, when that trouble arises, and it does sometimes. It may start over here. It might start over there. We go, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? Well, this is the way I see that the Bible says it. Whoa, 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 whoa. we got to be careful. Hey, there's some incredible Bible teachers and incredible people that lead groups. And they lead. And, and when they're on the page with what the Word of God says and what the Holy Spirit is teaching, and it is fundamentally right on the money, amen. When it's not, look out. Well, I like Bobby's teaching. He's a good Bible teacher. I've learned some of the best stuff I've ever learned from the Word of God from him. Brian, he's a great teacher. Boy, gosh, thank you, God, for him. For Dwayne, he can teach the Bible. we got small group leaders, some people that teach the young people. Uh, on and on and on it goes. We have to be aligned together with the Word of God aligned with what the Word says and what the Holy Spirit of God is leading you to say, which means that it behooves you to do something on your own so that you, in growing in the Lord and by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, now you become more mature, and then you hook yourself up to some men and some women who can teach you and guide you in, a, in what the Word says. And now when the Judaizers come and the legalists go, whoa, whoa, well, that doesn't sound like that's God. Let me look it up. Don't ask for the opinions. What does it say? What does it say? How does it go there? You see, we can get caught. When a pastor is facing some of that, or you are as a church leader, you need to face the wind, turn the ship, move the ship, move the bow of the ship right into that thing, and go right into the wind. 
because you need to face that storm. You can't ignore it. You need to prevent the church from having fights. They, can, they become holy wars. They don't need to happen. Some controversial issues that happen in church are just like at home. You don't even have a clue how it started. You don't even know. At least probably it never happened in your home. It happened like once, I think, in my life of being married to Cheryl 35 years. I have no idea why she ever gets mad at me. I don't understand it. I know. I still believe that. I like to believe that everybody loves me. I still. I like to think that, you know. It's a nice place to live. I digress. I would like you to consider this for the next few minutes. Just a little bit of personal application from this place. We've looked at things historically and doctrinally. Now, how does this come into play for me personally, for our church, as we continue to look at what Paul's teaching us to be free to live faith? You're free by his grace to live your life out completely by faith. Not the faith that I measure by watching your life, but rather by what the Father in heaven, Abba Father, desires for you and he shows you in his word. I don't know what God wants for my life. Well, open up the Bible. Turn anywhere. It's all good. No, when you have specific questions and specific stuff, well, go to another Bible study and go to another Bible study and go to another Bible study. I don't know like what he said. I don't know what Bobby was teaching on Wednesday, but I tell you what, it didn't sound right. <gasps> no! Here you are lying in a place of wondering, how does this personally apply to me if it goes down the road and I, I get stuck? Well, I see, again, Paul's statement through this letter and through this section as telling them, affectionately yours. I'm affectionately yours. I'm affectionately yours. So here's your first thought. Go to 1 Corinthians 4. And we'll have a couple of just supportive verses that make sense clearly because they line up beautifully with the word of God saying this statement. Spiritual birth. Oh, excuse me. Go to 1 Thessalonians. I jumped ahead. 1 Thessalonians. Would that be where we're going? Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing that. Spiritual birth brings labor pains. Yet the result is a child worth fighting for. Moms, you get it. You know. Gave birth to those babies. For some of you, whew, that labor was tough. There was a lot of laboring pain. Now think about the spiritual birth, everyone. <laughs> Lead somebody to the Lord. Moms and dads, you pray for your children to get saved from the very beginning. It's laborious. It's travail. It's aching. But the result is a child worth fighting for. We fight against our children instead of fighting for them. We think that it's okay to war up and fight up. Yes, you stand for what's right. And you have the, the better behavior way of doing it. And you ask the Holy Spirit to give you the word of God and whatever's applicable in that place to say, this is the way that this argument ought to go. But there's no sense of us fighting against our kids when we need to fight for them. Where are we here? Paul the apostle is a parent is saying, I'll fight for you. It was spiritually painful to have this church birth, but I'm here to fight for you. I love you and I care about you. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, familiar passage of scripture to many of you. It says in verse number 7, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, see that? Affectionately desirous of you. You think I make this stuff up, I just use the Bible. Affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. And if you're in that passage, it continues. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. I love you. I care about you. You were birthed spiritually, and now I'm in the game with you until the end. You say, well, I've had enough. It's too hard. The church is hard, and those people I led to the Lord, or the small group that I have, or the Bible study, they just won't do what I tell them to do. What are you going to do, invoke legalism? Bunch of laws? Bunch of rules? Or will you pray for them? 
Will you call them and tell them you have 15 minutes to buy them a coffee and talk to them and show them the grace of God that has changed your life and made the difference in your life so you've been able to walk with the Lord and see him just incredibly, lavishly pour out his grace in your life. You think you're sitting there because of some great stuff you did? It's by his grace that you're sitting there. Have you forgotten that? Paul's saying that to the church. We need to wake up and think, he's saying it to us. Somebody labored to give birth to you spiritually. What am I doing about it? That person says you're affectionately mine. My mess girl will never stop. Never stop being there for me. Because he led me to a place where I was birthed spiritually. How is it? Well, it's easy. We get derailed. We have tough times with the Lord. And we figure out, okay, I'll make God happy. I'll do three things this week and it'll make him happy. And then I get into a bad habit of doing it all the time and I don't get closer to him. He wants to hear from me. He wants to know my heart. He said he knows it. Yes, he does. He just wants you to come and spend fellowship time with him. The second thing, affectionately yours, is the spiritual growth, spiritual birth, the spiritual growth, it fights false teachers. Oh, boy. It's in the Bible. This is, we're just taking it from the Bible. Yet the result is a saint worth fighting for. Go to 1 Corinthians 4 now. Spiritual growth fights false teachers, yet the result is a saint worth fighting for. When you get saved, born again, and you start following the Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament teaches me that you're a saint. You don't have to have a memorial service or a celebration of life for you to be called a saint. The Bible teaches that after the book of, the Act, uh, book of Acts, all followers, all believers in Jesus Christ are saints. So, you're a saint. Tyler, you're a saint. No matter what Brittany says about you, you're a saint. Okay? You're a saint by his grace. By his grace, he made you a saint. No special religious ceremony. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 about these false teachers who are dangerous. They manipulate new Christians all the time. They're false teachers and they go after the Galatians. Galatian believers, they went after them. They persuaded them away from the truth and they get the believers to get separated from their congregation. They want to separate, pull them over and go, hey, let me tell you a couple little secrets about what the Bible says, about what I know what the Bible says. I'll tell you what the Bible really says. Whoa. They want to pull you from the fellowship. They want to pull you from the Holy Spirit of God teaching the word of God. This is a powerful warning from 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. It says in verse number 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Moms, you ever said that to your children? You have a lot of teachers. You have, but I gave birth to you, and I care about you more than anybody else. And now that you're on your spiritual journey, and now that you're following God, and you're walking after him, and you're saying, hey, please, God, show me what it's like to grow and to be mature in the Lord. How can I be aware of those false teachers? And you as moms are going, don't go see that person. Go don't hang out to that person. Don't go there. Don't go there. And your kids go, Hey, Mom, why don't you just stuff it? I can do what I want. I'm here to tell you that there's false teachers that want to pull you away from your family and pull you away from God. And they're everywhere. And if you think you don't think, you don't know that you think you might think, let me just tell you, as a dad of three girls, they're everywhere. So moms, keep on doing what you're doing. Romans chapter number 16, verse number 17 and 18 Paul does it again. By the way, if you have thousands of teachers, yet you don't have a spiritual father like me, you don't have a mom and dad like me. Whoo! Romans 16, verse number 17, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What doctrines? Go read the book of Romans 10 times and start writing them down. They're all there. You don't even have to travel far. 
Just read all 16 chapters. You get all the doctrine you need. There's the grace and the faith that Paul is communicating to that crew at Rome. Mark them that cause division. Get away from them. People that are false teachers want to do things contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. You don't know what you've learned? Call the office tomorrow and ask for someone to show you how to learn the Bible. And we will find somebody to do that ASAP as soon as we can find somebody. You'll learn how the doctrines flow, doing life through the doctrines. It's not the only place you do life. You don't just obey the doctrines to be a good legalistic person. No, the doctrines are your foundation blocks. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. Last one, affectionately yours. Through that birth and that growth, how about spiritual love? Spiritual love's different than just my fleshly love. I love you. I love you. I love you. We tell our grandchildren, I love you. Tell our children, I love you. But it means hardly anything to them unless they see it in action. But it wears out. And it, your tank gets lower and lower for that spiritual love unless you have the word. Unless you have the right spirit. Unless you're so tied in that you can say, hey, I can handle these fleshly battles because the world wants to teach you a different kind of love. A conditional type of love. A love that says, if you do a few things for me, I'll do a few things for you. It's rare when you meet someone who says, I love you unconditionally, but I love it when I see it, and I like to see it more. And when I see it more, I love it because there's a lot of those people that hang out at First Bible Baptist Church, and I love that about you. Because the result is a fruit bearer. Somebody bears fruit for the perfection of the saints and the sanctification. So there's love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. That's the basic of it. But then there's that person that says, hey, I need to give somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that fruit will bear. And that person will be born. And they will be birthed. And then they will have to grow. And then they will be in a place of fruit bearing. And here it keeps on going. God says, hey, I've got an incredible story for you. His name is Jesus. And I like to tell you, that I heard an old, old story about a Savior who came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. That's the story he wants to tell. And that's the story we want to tell to bear fruit. So I finish up in 1 John 4. We can do 1 John all day long. Verse number 4 says this. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. <laughs> you have overcome them. Well, that's the spirit of lies. You've overcome them. That's the spirit of the flesh, the spirit of Antichrist, as he references in verse number three. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Some of you have used that one before. It is true. Born again believer, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's that spiritual love. That's that love of Jesus Christ. That's the Holy Spirit of God that's within you. When you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ. The new creature is birthed. And you are a house, a vessel, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he lives in you and he confirms what the Word of God says. If you don't have any confirmation and all that, the Word of God is mumble jumble. But the Spirit of God says, hey, we've overcome. We're little children in Jesus Christ. And there's so much that goes with that. And we are greater because he is greater, not because of anything of me. He then goes down to verse number 10 and 11. There's so much here, but we'll just say them and go. Hey, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Once you get saved and born again, you have this new kind of love. It's a spirit-filled love. It's a spirit kind of love. And you need the word of God and his voice speaking to you about his love for you. You shut this off, then your spiritual love gets shut down. 
You open this word up and you let him keep on building that thing in you and oh boy, you will love people and love people and love people. Most of all, you'll love him. And it says there, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You can't miss there with that kind of stuff. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the sons of God. I finish with this thought here. Over that beautiful, affectionately yours and that spiritual birth and growth and love. When your spiritual parents, maybe they would come up and sit right next to you right now. Do you remember who led you to the Lord? Do you remember who told you about how to get saved? Do you remember that spiritual mother, that spiritual father? What if they came up to you and said, have you forgotten what I did for you? Have you forgotten that it was his grace that saved you? Why would you live the way you're living when you're free to live in Jesus Christ? If that question was asked of you by that person next to you who happens to be the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, what would stir in your heart and in your soul, what would you do from this point on? Please bow your head for a word of prayer. Now, some musical play, and I'm just going to play.